Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come. My name is Joey Reed. It's my privilege to be the pastor here at Mayfield First United Methodist Church. And we welcome you to worship this day. For those of you who are joining us in the sanctuary, I want to remind you about the six-foot social distancing. If the ushers seated you in a certain place, please try to stay there. If you're a little bit closer to folks that you don't normally sit around with throughout the week, Try to make sure that you are six feet apart. If you're not sure what six feet looks like, John Marshall has a piece of PVC pipe back there in the narthex, and he's more than happy to help you with that. Y'all think I'm kidding. <laughs> it's my honor to welcome you to Mayfield First. If you're joining us online at Facebook Live, or if you're watching later on in the week via YouTube, we are glad that you've chosen this as your place of worship today. If you would, please let us know that you're here in the comments section below. If you're in the sanctuary, you've got the option to utilize the digital bulletin since we're not printing anything out for anyone because we don't want to pass those things around. If you go to mayfieldfirst.com forward slash the letter Q and the letter R, that'll get you to the digital uh, supplements for today's worship. Uh, you can also submit prayer requests through that comment section or through the, the digital bulletin. You can just simply send an email to the office and that will let us know that you have someone that we are praying for with you. We're especially praying for the COVID-19 illnesses. We're remembering Carol Barnes and Betsy Barnes, and we are remembering David Collins. All of those folks are recuperating and recovering. And we are remembering those that you bring quietly and anonymously to God today. Those who are uh, on your hearts and minds, but you are maintaining those as unspoken requests. We also want to lift up one of our churches in the Purchase District. This week's church is Oakwood United Methodist Church, and her pastor is John Varden, a friend of mine from way back. That candle on your right my left has been lit to uh, represent those folks at Oakwood. Please keep those people in your thoughts and prayers. They symbolize the many churches that we are in solidarity with today as we pray and worship together. I want to let you know about some of the shout-outs that we have for people who are going above and beyond, people who are away and can't be with us. First one I want to mention today is Michael Coyle for all the work that he has done. Would you give God a thank offering for the hard work that he has accomplished? I mean, an incredible amount of work went into putting the sanctuary back together, getting things right, getting things clean, and taking care of the contractors as they came in and out, making sure everybody knew where they were supposed to be. Michael has been doing a fantastic job with that. And in a similar vein, we want to thank our safety team, those folks who are a part of the people who are, are keeping us safe and helping us to make sure that we have the proper temperatures and that you're wearing the right mask and that you're sitting in the right place. John Marsh has been leading that team, and he's been doing a fantastic job. We should give him a thank offering. He's back there listening. And all the other folks on that team as well. Our next shout-out is for Kent, for Charlotte, and for June. We remember them, though they can't be with us, and we look forward to the day when we will be able to be together again. So if you're listening, we want you to know that we are praying for you and with you. I should mention here that Buckley is in charge of the shout-outs. So our next one, <laughs> our next shout-out is for Debbie, 88 Keys, 10 Fingers, No Problem, Chaton. And... Uh, <laughs> I don't know that I can say any more than that, really. <laughs> but I should. <laughs> as, as we pivoted to do things differently during the pandemic, during the quarantine, when we were broadcasting with a, an empty sanctuary, I came to Debbie two or three times and said, can we do this differently? Can we add this? Can we do some different music? And her answer was always, no problem, we'll figure it out. And she has. She's done a magnificent job with that. So we are more than grateful for all that she has done. For all of you who have rolled with the punches and helped us to figure out what our next right step is, because it wasn't always the clearest thing for us to discern. But whatever those next right steps are, we know that today the next right step is to worship. And we are so glad that you have chosen this place is your place of worship today. As we continue our worship, our, our opening prayer is live and in person. Buckley will lead that for us. The words will be on your screen. Please join me. Gracious God, when the world's noise is turned up high, we come not to escape, but to seek wisdom and to focus on things that are worthy. Turn down the distractions in our minds Tune our senses to your word 
and our hearts to your praise. In your holy name we pray. Amen. And now you may stand up. Thank God I can say that again and join us with Joyful Joyful. <clears throat> Today it is the Nicene Creed. The words will be on the screen so that you can say what it is that we believe together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light. True God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And you can remain standing as we do. It's me, it's me, O Lord. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in need of prayer. It's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord, standing in need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in need of prayer. Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord. Thank you. 
We continue our service with the giving and receiving of God's offerings, God's tithes, our gifts. If you brought something with you that you would like to put into the offering plate, the bad news is there's no offering plate. The good news is we have offering boxes that are at the doors to the sanctuary. As you go out, you'll notice those finely crafted, handcrafted boxes that you can drop your gift, your tithe, whatever your offering may be into. If you don't have a gift that will fit into those boxes, a gift of your time or your talents, remember that there are plenty of ways that you can serve God. If you would prefer to give online or give in a way other than in person, there are three ways that you can give in addition to the blessing boxes here in person. The first is online at MayfieldFirst.com. All you have to do is click on the giving tab. There's a safe and secure place there for you to enter your banking information that will allow your tithe to come directly to the church. The other online way is to, uh, to, to text the word PROMISE to 73256. If you do that, then you don't have to worry about the, the computer or anything like that. You can do it right from your phone. Sending that text PROMISE to 73256 will start a conversation between you and some, some folks, probably a computer to be honest with you, to let you know how you can put your information in so that you can make your gift. And of course, you can mail it in to Mayfield First United Methodist Church, 214 South 8th Street, Mayfield, Kentucky, 42066. And as we give thanks during the offering today, remember the ways that you might give that aren't financial, your time, your talents, the gifts of your cupboard, as a matter of fact. We have a new blessing box down by the mission building, and it is full of food that might be utilized for folks who don't have enough to eat. If you have something that you want to drop off, bring it to the box. If it's full, <laughs> wait until later. If you need something, pick that up from the box. It's unlocked. It's open 24 hours a day, and our mission team is sponsoring that. We are grateful for all the folks who put a hand in to make sure that that happened, particularly the Marshall family. They uh, had a, a, a hand in putting that together, and I think Chris Guy was involved in some of that too. So would you give God a thank offering as we give our praise and thanks to those folks? And our offertory, or are we moving straight on? We are moving straight on. Would you stand and give God your thanks with the words of the doxology? The words will be on the screen as we sing together. Exodus, the 32nd chapter, the first 14 verses. We're using the New Revised Standard Version because they relax their copyright, and we are indeed grateful for that so that we can broadcast this over Facebook Live and YouTube. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people gathered around Aaron and said to him, Come, make gods for us who shall go before us as for this Moses, the man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. So all the people took off the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took the gold from them, formed it in a mold, and cast an image of a calf. And they said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it. And Aaron made proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a festival to the Lord. They rose early the next day, and they offered burnt offerings and brought sacrifices of well-being. And the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to revel. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once. Your people whom you have brought up out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. 
They have cast for themselves an image of a calf, and they have worshipped it. They have sacrificed to it and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And of you, I will make a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, and said, O Lord, why does your wrath burn hot against your people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians say it was with evil intent that he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to consume them from the face of the earth? Turn from your fierce wrath. Change your mind and do not bring disaster upon your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants, how you swore to them by your own self, saying to them, I will multiply your descendants like the stars of heaven and all this land that I have promised, I will give to your descendants and they shall inherit it forever. And the Lord changed his mind. The Lord changed his mind about the disaster that he planned to bring on his people. This is the word of God for you who are the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. change the mind of God? What does it mean to say or do something that actually changes the way that the Almighty thinks about God's people? I've had this conversation with a lot of different folks, theologians, professors, and it always comes down to how do we know about God's mind? How can we understand? Well, we look to Scripture. We have this passage and a couple of others where God changes God's mind. In fact, in the story of Noah, God is said to have repented of having created humanity. And that's why the destruction came upon the earth in the form of the flood. God changes God's mind. We have it from Scripture. So let's move past that quite quickly. We, however, as human beings, have a problem with folks who change their mind. If you're like me, you get a little irritated when you make all these plans, say something as simple as, well, we're going out to eat tonight, and this is where we're going. And then everybody gets in the car, and that's when it starts. I don't know if I, that's where I want to go. I think I want to go someplace else. Let's talk about where else we can And the plan changes. And when their minds start to change, my mind starts to think red, dark thoughts. <laughs> not that bad, but sometimes it feels like it's that bad. I get upset when I hear things like, eggs are bad for you, and then the next year, eggs are good for you. Cholesterol works this way, and then cholesterol works that way. Can't they make up their minds? Why do people have to change their minds? The answer is pretty simple. When new information is introduced, we have to change our Otherwise, you get to be like some of these folks that are running around on the internet telling us that the earth is flat. You know, for a long time, that's the way things were. The earth was flat, and that's just how it was. Even if you were to ask the rabbis what the ancient 
Israelites, what the ancient Hebrew people thought the earth looked like, it started with a straight line. And the foundations that went down, the firmament that went over, the rabbis will tell you very quickly, we no longer believe that. Why? Because we have proof. We know that that was a mistaken idea. We have new information. And so we changed. What information was brought from Moses to God for God to change God's mind? In this passage, we have to wrestle with the idea that sometimes the things that we do make God so mad that for a moment, for a moment, God forgets. That's the only thing that I can walk away from this passage with. That's the only thing that makes sense. Otherwise, it's just play acting. It's just a sham. He's just saying this so that Moses will respond a certain way because it's just God and Moses there on the mountain. What else might the point be? So Moses can go back and say, y'all, you have no idea. God was so mad he was going to wipe you out, but I stepped in. Changed his mind. I did. I changed his mind, and now he's not going to wipe all of you out. No, no, you're welcome. You're welcome. I have a hard time believing that that would be allowed to stay in Scripture. If it was just Moses making a big deal out of something that he may or may not have done. This passage comes to us as scripture. That means we look at it and we understand it to be the truth that has been imparted to us through our tradition. And if we take scripture seriously, we look at what it says. God changed God's mind. So what shall we say then about our generation, about the way that we behave, about the things that we sometimes turn to. It's easy for us to say, well, I've never taken off an earring and asked someone to cast it as an idol, a gold calf in particular. But God would say and has said that our idols don't always look like a golden calf. If you're curious about what our idols might be, I've been told by several pastors who were my pastor that all you have to do is go to your checkbook and look at the registry and see what that register says. Where does your money go? What are the sacrifices and the offerings that you make? I'm afraid a lot of us would be worshiping at the altar at Amazon or Walmart or various places where we go to get food. It seems that we spend a lot of time and effort on things that are not God. The real problem comes when we go from just giving our attention and devotion to those things and we actually start to worship them. When we get to that point, we are worse than the Israelites because we are saying things like this represents God and this symbol, this idea, this group to which we belong, this is God, this is God's will, this is how we are supposed to behave. When God has clearly given us ideas that say otherwise. Our scripture, our traditions, our own experiences of the Holy Spirit, and certainly our ability to reason through those things. What shall we do then with this message that Moses brings to us from his encounter with God that is recorded in scripture for us? That we might understand what it means for God to lose God's temper with us over this particular incident. I've seen a lot in the last few days about the the constant divide that has been going on in this country. You've been hearing about it, I'm sure, for the last 10 years. But it has become something that we cannot ignore. This division that we have in our nation, we are coming to a place, my friends, where people, smart people, fear violence in the streets that we drive, the sidewalks where we walk, the places that we go. I don't know that that's going to come to Mayfield, Kentucky, but I don't want it to come to the United States of America. 
We have become a place where we have decided who our important folks are. And we have decided what our important ideas are. And quite often in that divide, it's not the same thing. And what's left, what's left out, is God. We make excuses. We say things like, well, this is what God would want, even if it's not the way that we're accustomed to God operating. Or we say, this, this is what God would want, because those other people are bad. They don't think like we do. They don't act like we do. And because they are different from us, we have God and they don't. We know God is on our side. When in actuality, God stands where God has always stood. I was told at a very young age, if you look around and you see that you're far from God, and you're not sure when God moved, you should disabuse yourself of that idea very quickly. Because the reality is, God stays where God is. It's we who move. And when we find ourselves far from the places that God asks us to be, when we find ourselves far from the ideas that God has given to us to hold fast, to keep, to use to guide our lives, and the way we interact with people, when we have gotten far enough away from those things, we are no better than the Israelites when they asked Aaron, oh, just make us a God. That Moses is gone. That's our excuse. Moses is gone. We don't know what's become of him. So you do it. You lead us. You tell us how good we are. Tell us how perfect we are. And give us something to bow down to. Something that we will now say is responsible for bringing us up out of Egypt. Just when I think that it's only the Israelites in that particular situation that could be so narrow-minded and stiff-necked as to think that something that Aaron just created could be responsible for all the events that had gone before. Isn't that ridiculous? Does that not strike you as you read through this passage? These people are worshiping a brand new idol and are willing to say it is this idol that brought us up out of Egypt. We latch on to the shiny things. We latch on to the things that tell us what we want to hear about ourselves. It's called confirmation bias. And it's one of the most dangerous aspects of our psychology. When we hear what we want to hear, that's where we go. That's what we hold on to. To the extent that we've even taken to looking at our leaders, our politicians, the people that we turn to for instruction, guidance, and governance. And when they change their minds, we don't say, oh look, he or she has discovered new information that we might ought to look into. That's not what we say. What do we say about them? We say that they have... Oh, I've, I've awakened some of you. I'm sorry. They have flip-flopped. It's bad to change your mind when you're a leader. Because if you get that title that you have flip-flopped, it means that you were wrong. You were either wrong then or you were wrong now. I have news for you folks. You don't have to worry about that. As followers of Jesus Christ, you don't have to worry about anybody ever looking at you and saying, you flip-flopped. Because if you're doing it right, if you're doing it right, Christ follower, you're standing up every day and saying, I have flip-flopped. The church language for that is repentance. It's the 180. It's the change from going in this direction that leads to destruction, the sin-filled lives that we have all toyed with, turning in the opposite direction and going instead in the way that God wants us to go. So if anybody ever says, you flip-flopped, you say, I certainly did. In the name of Jesus, I certainly did. If we, who are the people of change, if we, who are the people of repentance, if we, who are the, the people of the second chance, can't say that out loud. How far have we gone? 
How far have we moved from God to say that, no, no, everlasting unto everlasting, I will never change my mind. That planet is flat. It sounds silly now. You have no idea how big the flat earth society is. Don't be a part of it. Because it's not just about geography or astronomy and the shape of planets. It's also about our inability to say, you know what? I was wrong. You know what? I, I shouldn't have done that. You know what? I used to think this, but now I think this. And when we get to a place where we're not sure if that's okay, because people might say something about us, not only are you the people of the second chance, not only are you the people of changed lives, changed hearts, changed minds, you serve a God who is willing to change God's mind. It's right here in Scripture. And if you're going to take Scripture seriously, and boys and girls, friends and neighbors, ladies and gentlemen, you'd better be taking Scripture seriously. God changed God's mind. And he calls upon us to do the same thing. Not just in matters of sin and righteousness, but in matters of simple understanding. Because if we cannot be believed when we speak about things that are provable, that are data-driven, that are a given, then how can we be expected to be believable when we talk about matters of faith and the things that cannot be seen, the things that cannot be measured, the things that cannot be understood without an open heart and an open mind? Willing to receive the instruction of the Holy Spirit. Willing to receive the power of the words of Jesus Christ. We take those things on faith. We ask our friends and neighbors to only trust Him. But how can they trust Him if we who are the messengers can present untrustworthiness? And be proud of it. When God changed God's mind in this instance, it meant that God's people lived. It meant that they didn't have to start over. It meant that they did the 180. And the story goes on. And we hear more and more about how Moses led them in that repentance. And folks, it wasn't pretty. Later on in this story... Moses melts down that golden calf. And he does the playground equivalent, well, the very difficult playground equivalent, if you like it so much, why don't you marry it? Worse than that, he melts down the golden calf and he gives it to those who demanded it to drink. There is a reckoning. There is justice in this world. There is a holiness to which we are called. And that holiness means that we are not only obedient to God, but that we are doing things that make God proud of us, that we are doing the things that God has asked of us, not so that we can be saved, but because we have been saved. Because balanced with holiness is our Wesleyan understanding of the grace of Jesus Christ. How do you keep obedience and holiness with something like grace that says, no, it's okay, I love you, I forgive you? How do you hold those things? I'll tell you how you hold those things. You hold those things in a miraculous tension. A tension that can be mind-numbing. A tension that can cause the muscles that you're holding those things together with to absolutely become exhausted so that at some point you feel like you have to turn to one absolute or another. But those polar absolutes get you nowhere. Holiness, if that's all you've got, who can stand before the Lord? 
For none of us can claim righteousness nor holiness without the salvation that is given to us through Jesus Christ. And if we abandon holiness and we say only forgiveness, only grace, then we have cheapened the death of Jesus Christ on the cross to the point of non-existence. Everybody gets saved. Everybody gets grace. Everybody. Do what you want. There's grace for everybody. No. There is grace sufficient to the day. And there is holiness expected at all other times. No excuses. No saying, but this is the way that we're going to get to what God wants. This is how we're going to do the will of God. To sacrifice our principles. To sacrifice the things that we were brought up to know were good and bad? Absolutely not. Yes, there is grace. And it covers a multitude of sins. But as Paul said, don't rush to sin just because there is grace. Shall we sin more that grace might abound? I think you remember the two words from before the pandemic. Absolutely not! We must understand that when Paul tells us about grace, it's for the moments when our human frailty causes us to slip. It's in those moments of weakness that God's grace comes in and fills us and says, it's okay. You are loved, child of God, person of worth. In my house, we have always, always tried to avoid when someone says, I'm sorry for what I did, saying, oh, it's okay. It's okay. You're good. How many times a week do we hear that? You're fine. You're okay. We've lost that theological grounding that teaches us, no, no, what you did was wrong. What you did was a mistake. What you did was an error. The only way it can be okay is because we are able as the people of Jesus Christ to say, I forgive you. Do you see how that's different from you're okay, you're fine. It may mean the same thing, but it doesn't say the same thing. And we're raising a generation by a generation who has been raised to possibly think that it's okay. It's all right. You can get off the straight and narrow and then get right back on. And it's, it's okay. That's not what Moses said when Moses came down off the mountain. Moses said to the people of Israel, you have sinned in the eyes of God. Knock it off. And when we find ourselves in that place where we have compromised and contradicted and spoken of things of the gospel as if they were things of the world to gain power, to gain control, to gain influence, when we have compromised those things, our golden calf is more than obvious. And if we can see it, how long do you think it's been since God first noticed it? We've all been complicit. We've all played the games, politics, power, influence, community standing. In one way or another, we've all found our way into those moments where we said, Hey, this really isn't a religious situation. Let's deal with this in earthly terms. Because you know what? We can take this and get to where we're going. I think this is the part where God says, no, enough. I can, I can envision God losing God's temper. The steam flowing out of God's ears. The breaking of God's heart. To see the people who have wept at this chancel rail, 
the people who have cried tears of joy and repentance, who have made promises, promises, covenant vows. We don't lay our covenants aside for convenience sake. We don't lay aside the vows that we took when we picked up our cross to follow Jesus. And when we find ourselves with the cross laying to one side and somebody else's banner over us, in the name of Jesus, you better believe there's a golden calf around here somewhere. This passage pertains Because if God is as upset about this as God was upset about that, and I don't think that it's just possible, it is my personal, professional, theological opinion that God is uptight right now with the way we're behaving. Does anybody think that that might not be the case? Does anybody think that we might be in good standing with God, that Jesus is tickled pink with the way we're behaving? I think that this sermon title to change God's mind should become something that we each are thinking about as we move forward. The next days of our lives, the next few weeks, months, and years, I pray that every day you're asking yourself what covenant you have made. Because there's a difference between making covenant with God and making a deal with the devil. This line is long, and this way is narrow. Narrow is the gate, friends and neighbors. But wide is the path that leads us to our destruction. And we make ourselves believe. We make ourselves believe that it's okay. Because of confirmation bias. Because of human frailty. You call it whatever you want. But it's right here in this chapter of Exodus. It's in the book that we hold dear. And it breaches the covenant that we made with our lips, with our heart, and with our lives. So as Moses said to the people of Israel, knock it off. I personally plead with God on a regular basis to turn us around, to change the way we act, to change the way we behave, to change the way we think first, to change the way we worship. So many people come to worship looking to get supercharged to go back out and fight the good fight. I remember when I was little, there were these toys that you would wind up and you would put them in a little cage match kind of thing, and they would just wind up and go all over the place, and you would have to redirect them. You know, they were all ready to go, supercharged. And here's mine, the one that I just wound up, in a neutral corner, banging on that neutral corner, getting nothing done, because it was facing the wrong direction. Moses pleaded with God, to anticipate the repentance that was to come. The 180 that would bring the people of Israel out of not a neutral corner, but a corner where they had no business being. To get back into the fray. And to go where they had been told to go. To do what they had been told to do. To be who they had been called to be. And I make that same plea with God regularly your behalf and mine, and mine, listen closely, one of your hymns lied to you today. Not the preacher, not the deacon, but it's me, oh Lord. I didn't stop singing. It is the preacher, and it is the deacon as well. Not your mother, not your father. Yes, them too. This is rhetoric. It's not really a lie. I say that to say this, we all have made that covenant, and we've all fallen short. That's why grace is needed. But my friend,
friends, once the grace has been given, prodigal sons and daughters, after the party is over and the calf, <laughs> the calf has been consumed, holiness. Get up the next day and go to work in the fields just like everybody else. That's how that parable ends. I'm convinced of it. What must we do to change God's mind? We intercede as we have never interceded before. We beg God's forgiveness for who we have become and the things that we have done. And when we get past those things, holiness. Move back to the things that make for covenant discipleship. Listening carefully for what it is that Jesus is asking us to do specifically that we might be in keeping with the general words of our covenant. We've moved well past this theological conundrum. Does God change God's mind? Lord, we better hope so. We better pray so. Pray with me. Lord, repentance is not something that we take lightly, but it is something that we sometimes forget to take seriously. We know what it means to have changed the route that was leading us to destruction. We know what it means to have changed the path that was leading us to our own end. And so as we have wandered, oh God, we pray that whatever angle, anger may be kindled against us, that you would allow it to dissipate. That you would hear the fervent prayers of the righteous among us, who among us is righteous. We pray for the blood of Jesus Christ to intercede in our behalf and where we have made excuses, where we have been complicit for the purpose of earthly power, earthly influence, we ask that you would replace those intentions with an influence that is entirely heavenly. And as we make these changes, O oh God, we pray that you will lead us into all righteousness for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ, who was and is and is to come. you're not sure what it means to follow after Jesus and you can't figure out what the big deal is, what is he talking about breaching covenant? What is he talking about being complicit? If you think for just a moment about what Jesus is asking of you to follow after him, to walk in his ways, to do the things he did the way that he did them, then I invite you to come forward and accept Christ for the first time today. If you've already done that, but you realize that you may have slipped off the path, or in good old-fashioned United Methodist terms, you become a backslider. And you've been making some really poor excuses for your behavior. If you're ready to give what's left to God. No, not just what's left, what's right. Then make that second commitment. And let God have those things that you've been holding back. The things that you've been saying, no, you don't belong here. This is not your word. This is the way the world works. And if you simply need to pray about those things, pray where you are, pray at the chancel. The last invitation is for those who are coming from a different church, maybe a church where you've been taught that this complicity is acceptable if it gets us to where God wants us to be. God requests and requires holiness. And if you seek that holiness, that's what's being preached here today. And if I'm doing anything right every day, Whatever the invitation, as you see fit to respond, there are three stations here, and we will wait for as long as it takes for these stations to fill up and empty, to fill up and empty. If you have something that you need to bring to the chancel rail to lay at the altar of God, this chancel is the place to do it. Will you ponder this invitation as we sing? And
please won't you respond as God leads you? Please say. you to stay where you are. I forgot last week and I've been castigated appropriately. I would invite you to stay where you are so that the ushers might dismiss you so that we can avoid that glomming up and the crowds at the door. So please stay where you are until the ushers dismiss. God bless. Behind every good 